this conflict what happened because these two teams are at odds with one another. Basically, it's pretty simple. They are headed in two different directions. There is a goal line here, and there is a goal line there, and their job for the better part of three hours is to interfere with the other's progress. There is nothing, in fact, you can do to stop this conflict. Uh, it is the nature of the field on which they have been gathered. But in the midst of these two teams, there's been inserted a third team. It's a team of officials made up of nine people whose job it is to be on the field, but not on the field. Uh, their role is to be in the middle of the conflict without themselves becoming part of the conflict. They've been given authority by the commissioner of the NFL in New York, Roger Goodell, who represents the kingdom of the officials of the National Football League, and they're given authority to the players down there on the field. Now get this, these officials are not to stop the conflict, but they are to make it manageable, if you will, by their presence and the authority given to them by the commissioner. Each of these nine officials have been given a book, and they've been given this book, and they are to know this book from cover to cover. They must know every jot, every tittle. They must know what this book even has to say. So they've been given this book. They're going to know this book. Uh, they don't want to know the personal opinion of the official. That's not important. We don't want to know the official's personal opinion. We want their decision to be made upon not their personal opinion, but upon the book in which they have studied. These officials know that they're not in a popularity contest because many times these officials will become unpopular by both teams. They know that sometimes they will be cheered, they will be applauded, but they're not on the field for standing ovation. They're not on the field for applause. They're not on the field for a pat on the back. We're on the field for one reason, to live out the rules of the book in which they have studied that they've been given authority by the commissioner of the National Football League. These officials, I mind you, are not hard to recognize. You would never have to guess, hey, I wonder who the officials are. Because you know who the officials are, they're easy to recognize, they wear black and white jerseys. They do not wear the jerseys of the other team. They do not wear a Dallas Cowboy jersey. They do not wear a Carolina Panther jersey. Because you see, when they give a ruling, they cannot have a favorite on in the game. If they have favorites with the Cowboys and they make a ruling, the other team will say, this game has been tainted. This game is not right. You have to have an opinion that's from the book. You don't rule because you like this team or you like that team. You rule according to the book. To be sure, these officials are greatly outnumbered. There are only nine officials on the football team. Each team has 53 players. That's 106 to be exact. Not counting the coaching staff of each team. Not counting in a usual year the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the stadiums. So these players are younger. They are stronger. They are faster. These officials are older, are fatter, and are slower. <laughs> but see, here's the whole thing. These officials know that these players have power. And these players can knock them down. But these officials have something that the players don't have. The officials have authority from the National Football League. And although the players can knock the officials down, the official can throw you out of the ball game. So they have been given authority. I give all that dialogue to come to this one point. You and I need to understand that in the world that we live in today, you and I, our God's officiated crew in the world we live in. We live in a world of conflict, don't we ever? All kinds of conflict. We got Republicans, we got Democrats, we got them against one another. 
We got blacks against whites, whites against blacks, poor against the wealthy, uh, socialism against capitalism. We have poor against all types of people. We have heterosexuals against homosexuals. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the conflict today in America. We cannot, as kingdom people, take the side of any particular team. Because we must be in the middle given our rules, not from our opinion, but from this book. Because we want to be able to tell, tell the Republican and tell the Democrat, not what my opinion is, but what the Word of God says. So when it comes to living in this world that I live in, I want you first of all to know that the adjective that describes me is that not I'm a Republican. It's not that I'm a Democrat. It's not that I'm a capitalist or socialist. The adjective that describes me is not that I'm poor or wealthy. The first adjective to describe me is this. I am standing before you a child of Almighty God. That's my first adjective. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. This other stuff, that stuff will pass away. The Republican Party one day will be done away with. The Democratic Party one day will be no more. But I am here to tell you some good news. The kingdom I'm part of will last forever and ever. That king is eternal. That kingdom is forever. So I am not saying today I'm side with the Republican or I'm side with the Democrat. I want you first of all to know this. The thing that defines me is I am blood bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this man in front of you was one day on the way to hell. He had no purpose for living, but he met a man named Jesus Christ on April 20th, 1980. And he set me free from the power of the devil. I had chains upon me. He came by and set me free. And since that day in 1980, this has been a man for one allegiance only. I'm not on sale to nobody else. I belong only to Jesus Christ. And the decisions I make is not based upon a Republican rule book. It's not based upon a Democratic rule book. And what gets me is this. How some of you people seem more enthusiastic about a Republican or a Democrat than you do about the Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You'll go crazy over politics. But you'll sit in the church pew like a dollar on a log and won't say a word, won't do a thing. In case you don't know, the Republican Party one day will be no more. The Democratic Party will be no more. If you want to cheer for them, cheer for them. But I tell you what I'm cheering for, the kingdom of God Almighty forever. And that kingdom lasts forever. I'm on Yahweh's side. That's your side. I'm on. Now that does not mean I do not have some opinions. Yes, I have opinions. And nobody will know those opinions. And I'll tell you why. <coughs> My opinion for you when it comes to your eternal soul for damnation of heaven or hell. I don't want my opinions to cloud my view of you because I want you to look at me, not vice with anything, but when I want to look at you, I want you to know that my kingdom that I'm talking to you about is the kingdom of God. It's not the Republican kingdom. It's not the Democratic kingdom. It's not the Socialist kingdom. It's not the Capitalist kingdom. Although I have my opinions, my opinion for you is where do you stand with the kingdom of Almighty God. So when I talk to a person, that's my thought. That's my goal. That doesn't mean the other stuff's not important. It is important. But what's more important is your soul. Now I'm going to say some things in the next 30 minutes that many of you will not like. In fact, you will say, I've got a cut that is okay because I'm not here to be popular I'm here to give the word of God and that's it first of all is this you never put politics and religion together never now I'm not saying you have any preference you can but you never mix it the gene of the politics and religion put Jesus to death on the cross. 
the religious people were the Sanhedrin. And they was on with the Roman Empire. And they put Jesus to death on the cross. You never wrap the cross of Christ in a Republican flag. You never wrap the cross of Christ in a Democratic flag. The cross of Jesus Christ stands by itself. It's not wrapped in a Republican flag. It's not wrapped in a Democratic flag. The cross stands alone on the hill that cannot be hid. It's a bright city. And my dear friends, that's where the cross stands. And so what I'm going to say in the next 28 minutes, some of it will be, well, I agree with that. Some will be like, I've never thought of that. And then some will be like, that's one incredible preacher. <laughs> And then some will say, he needs to be on his medicine. <laughs> so, let's start. Um, would you say today that America's in a mess? Yeah. 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 And I just ask some stupid questions. Did we get there today? In fact, it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? A long time. And I'll prove everything I'm going to say that I'm telling you right now. There's one law I want to go over before I get to my main points, because this law is very important to my message. And it's the law of sowing and reaping. It's in Galatians 6, 7. And that just simply says this, Do not be deceived. God is not made fun of. What a remain sows, that shall be read. And I've given you this principle 25 times. This is the law of the harvest. You know it very well. This is based on Galatians 6. Number one, we reap much, we do not sow. In other words, someone else did the work, someone else did the planting, we reap the benefits. Where I lived there, before I lived there, a man planted so many fruit trees, Persimmon trees, I mean blueberries. I got blueberries all the blueberry season. They go from this wall to that wall, three stands of them, and they come in all summer long. And people say, Charles, what have you done? And I said, I've done nothing. The man before him did this work, and I'm reaping the benefits. Glory to God. Amen. I've read a book. I want you to read this book. It's part of the summer. It's just based on salt. Salt. It's a book based on what? Salt. And the whole book deals with how salt has been very important in the development of civilizations. And how people used to be paid by salt. That man's not worth his salt. And the book deals with salt. And the reason I'm saying that is this. Uh, much of what we have today, we didn't get, but it's because someone else didn't work. Number two. We reap the same in time as we sow. If you sow good, you reap good. If you sow bad, you reap bad. Do you know of some people that always they're surrounded by drama? Well, that's all they sow is drama. Drama. Do you see some people? They have so many friends, and the reason being, they're always going around and they make themselves friendly. So if I go around and I make myself friendly and make myself a friend and if I'm cordial and if I'm nice, I'm showing friendship, I'm going to reap what? Friendship. But then there are some people who will say this, I don't have any friends. Well, that tells me you don't show any friendship. Right? What else do you mean? Whatever you sow, you reap. If you walk in a room, and if you just walk by people like you do on Sunday morning, and walk by all these people, and don't say hello to them, and then have the audacity to say, I don't have any friends. Or if I go to this room, I say, no, what's up? You see, what's up? And I make myself friendly. Whatever I sow, I reap. It's not a principle. Number three, I don't spend much time on this. Number three is we reap in a different season than we sow. We do not plant a tomato seed today 
and give a tomato in our hand tomorrow at this time. Number four, we reward them. We sow one tomato seed. They say it can yield 25 pounds of tomatoes. Glory to God. Five, we reap in, pro in proportion as we sow. If I sow a little, I reap a little. If I sow a lot, I reap a lot. So that's just in proportion. Number five, we reap the full harvest of the good only if we persevere. That's the big point. If we do not grow weary. The evil comes to the harvest on, on its own. Weeds have no problem. They just grow. Number seven, we cannot do anything about last year's harvest only this year's. Now back to my point. Did we just get in this situation that we have in America today? Of course, the answer is no. So you must keep that in mind as I do this message because it's really the key to what I'm going to tell you. We did not arrive on November 1st, 2020 with the mess we're in in one year. Not in two years. Not in five. Not in ten. There has been a lot of sowing for decades. And now we have a big problem. So let's start. Basic Theology 101. Are you ready for this big point? Now, this blows you away. Get something to drink. <laughs> We're all born in sin. Romans 3.23 says what? For how many have sinned? Thank you. All have sinned. So, I ever asked one of us this morning are sinners. As the old saying goes, when you have a baby, you say, oh, look at this little angel. But what you discover is this. The longer their legs get, the shorter their wings get. Because you just happen to see it. I think my favorite definition of sin is you put two two-year-olds in one room with one toy. You see sin. <laughs> and they're just two years old. Two years old. One toy, two two-year-olds, step back and watch the action. Who says, where do we go? Where does that come from? Where does that, that's mine. I want to have that. Give me that. It's because we're born into sin and then it's just there. So we're all born with this corruption. True? We're all born with this wretchedness that defiles. Uh, it stars beauty. When sin, when sin comes upon the world, it darkens wisdom, defiles love, robs purity, steals peace, and it separates us from God. It's the only thing that keeps society in a livable predicament. It's goodness. And that goodness is the Holy Spirit. Did I prove it? Yea, you may. Thank you. There's coming today. The only good in this world right here today is by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit of God. Would you agree with that? If you're here this morning and you're able to breathe, it's by the grace of God. If you have money in your pocket to give your kids, it's by the grace of God. Everything we have is by the grace of God. Everything. Everything good. Don't, don't miss this point. Everything good comes from God. Everything. There's come a day, however, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, where the restrainer, who is the restrainer? The Holy Spirit is taken away from this world. <clears throat> what do you think will happen when the Holy Spirit, which is good, when God, who is good, is taken away from this evil society? This will happen. And one day, the Holy Spirit will be removed from this world. And everything good is going to be gone. You think it's bad now? It's good. So, if anything good happens in this world, it's by the grace of God, which brings me to Matthew 5, verse 13 and 14, to prove my point. Look at this. You are the, oh, here's the word, Salt of the earth. Now, can I ask a dumb question? And I love asking dumb questions. God could have used anything as an example to describe his people. But he chose to use the example of salt. You are salt! 
You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by people. You're the light of the world. A city on the hill that cannot be hidden. Now don't miss this key principle in Jesus' metaphors of salt and light. Listen, please. Citizens of the kingdom of heaven impact society because they are different from the kingdom of the world. So we're in a world of sin, right? When sin came into the world, it defiles everything. And the only thing that keeps this world being good is the grace of God and the people of God. I'll prove it. What does salt do? Well, this book says, it's amazing. This book says, they have proved by this book, salt can do, you will, you will not believe this book. When I read it, I said, okay. <laughs> This book says salt does 14,000 things. 14,000. You're the salt of the world. I listed with my little mind, I'm not thinking 14,000. I thought, or <laughs> salt preserves, salt flavors, salt heals, and salt brings health to the body. So in society, we're the salt of the earth. We should preserve the society. Right? We should heal the society. We should bring flavor to the society, and the society should be healthy. Because who's the salt of the world? <coughs> Is our society healthy? Is our society a mess? This follows. Ours. Thank you. You're so So you say that the society's messed up, and we are saying that. They do mess it up. The Republicans? The Democrats? Who messed it up? Christians. Christians. No, I'm right, correct. <coughs> You're so the world. You bring help to society. You preserve society. You heal society. You bring flavor to society. That's what you do. You're the son of the world. Look, Charles, there's so many churches on the corner. There's so many churches growing. No. If you believe that stuff like denominations do, I'm not trying to be mean. You're stupid. <laughs> So God has left the believers in this world, right? John 17, you're in the world, but don't be of the world. Remember, that's the first verse I read. Remember that? Uh, two minutes ago. You're in the world, but don't be of the world. That means this. The world is decaying. The world is walking in darkness. But you know who you are? You're salt and you're light. So when you come in the world, you are to preserve a society. You are to bring hope to a society. You are to bring healing to a society. Because this world is decaying. This world is in darkness. And they don't know what they're doing. But I got my church. And you know what they do? They will preserve. And yet, every 
word in this room says today, America is in a mess. Are you with me this morning? This one's your words. So salt is needed because the world is rotting and decaying. And the reason our world is rotting, listen, the reason our world is rotting and decaying is because our Christianity is rotting and decaying. Is there another reason? So the world's right. When you, when you say America is in trouble, when, when you say that, <laughs> America is decayed, when you say that, it's not only because the church is right and decayed. Now, now you won't hear this in every church because every church don't want to take bad news over the crowd. Let's explain it this way. This sanctuary is a salt shaker. I'm salt. You're salt. You're salt. You're salt. And so salt, 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 salt. So this sanctuary this morning is a salt shaker. And so we're gathered together here once a week to have a lot of fellowship with other members of salt. 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 We're all salt here are in the room. So, when this service is over, God wants to pick up the salt shaker and He wants to shake it in Ashburn. And He wants to say, I'm shaking it on y'all. When you go to school, you need salt at school. I'm shaking on you. When you go to work, you need salt at work. And you need salt at work. And you need salt. And you need salt. So wherever y'all go, let's salt the world for Jesus. Because we're salt shakers. We come together and we're a big salt shaker. And we're here and we've got all this salt. So we're going to go out and we're going to salt the world. The salt sitting in a salt shaker will never accomplish its purpose until it's shaken out in the decaying world. We're not responsible for conversions. We're responsible for contact. Now, when you put salt on a wound, it burns. When you drink, you taste salt. So evidently the world's around us and we're not burning. We're not making thirsty. The world says, I was messed up as I am. It's just pretty simple. God has put some restraints into human life. And these restraints are critical to civilization survival. And when these restraints are carefully maintained and carefully obeyed, our life goes well. But when these restraints are not done, we see what's going on today in America. Fast forward. It is now November the 4th, Wednesday morning. <coughs> I wonder about we'll see. I'm not talking about the election. <coughs> I wonder about we'll see in the streets of America this morning. We'll say it's a mess. God said, yeah. There are four standards of authority God, family, government, and church. I'm going to go over all four. Second family. Um, 
The family is a realm of authority. Deuteronomy 6, 7, God says, Teach your children the laws of God. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So the number one job of families, the number one job of parents, is to place the image of God upon your children correctly. Later on it says in the book of Psalms that it's the job of each generation to impart to the next generation the mighty works of God. So if we're saying this generation's messed up, well, who taught that generation? Right? You see, it's my job as dad, my wife's job as mother, to impart upon Josh Moses, Stephanie Moses, and Kara Moses, our main job is this, to put on our kids the correct image of God. That's our number one job. It's not the church's job. It's not the youth camp's job. It's our job. So everything Josh Moses believes right about God, he got from his dad. Everything he believes wrong about God, he got from his dad. It's true. Everything your kid believes right about God, you got from you, mom and dad. And everything your kid believes wrong about God, you got from you, mom and dad. If your kid believes God is loving and caring, you know who you got that from? Mom and dad. But if he believes God is critical and hateful, where do you get that from? Mom and dad. If mom and dad fight and are unforgiven, or if mom and dad is this way, if mom and dad goes to you and says, you can't do anything right, or if mom and dad is real legalistic, well, that will be God's being legalistic or not forgiven or that kind of stuff. You can prove this with the Word of God. I can prove this by the book I've told you now five times. It's called this, B-I-T-C. He wrote Faith of the Fatherless, and he was an atheist. And at 39 years old, he gave his heart to God, and he was an atheist. And he did in 4,000 years, that amazes me, 4,000 years of research on atheism. 4,000 years. Can you believe that? of studying all famous atheists. And all atheists have one thing in common. Charles Pretell, what is that one thing they have in common? Well, that one thing in common is this. All atheists hate their father. And they say this. If God is like my dad, or God is like my mom, they're king. What's the last thing the book of Malachi God's not going to speak for 400 years. There's Malachi man 400 years of silence. The last thing God tells Malachi to tell the children of Israel is this. I will return the hearts of the fathers to the children. John the Baptist gets on the shores of, of, of the Jordan River and you know what he says? I will return the hearts of the fathers to the children. Why? Because God knows that the way mom and dad teaches those kids will give a reflection of God. Are y'all with me? Now, I wrote this down and the way I wrote it, I really like it. I'm not trying to buzz what I thought. You wrote good control. This <laughs> is Family is the divinely created institution for the formation. Here's what I like. I get this. Family is the divinely created institution for the formation of, get this, restrained sinners. Now we're all sinners, right? So the family, mom and dad, is to be able to teach little children to be restrained in sinners. That when they grow up, they are beneficial to society. Because if you read the book of Proverbs, Proverbs says it sends kids to go buck wild. Right? 
Yes, Charles. And the book of Proverbs says, when your kid does some crazy things, mom and dad, you need to do this. Because you see, if you don't teach those kids to respect authority, mom and dad, they will not respect higher authority. So the first authority is mom and dad. This is real simple. And if your child does not respect mom and dad, and your child goes to school, will your child respect the teacher? No. Okay, who is not to levels of authority? So if your child does not respect mom and dad, and if you don't respect the teacher, will your child respect the law? No. Will your child respect God? No. But where did it start, God? Mom and dad. God's not going to pass. God's not going to bypass the church house or even your house to fix the White House. See, we're worried about getting the White House fixed. God is saying, the problem's not the White House. The problem is your house and the problem is my house. And the reason America's in the mess is not because of the White House. It's because of your house that the nation's in the mess. Then I just get loops of desperation. <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> I just need a government, second goal, authority. Uh, I just read Romans 13. Everyone must obey state authorities because no authority exists without God's permission. And the existing authorities have them been put there by God. Well, whoever opposes the existing authority opposes by God's order. So basically in the New Testament, there are two ministers in the New Testament. Do who they are? In the Bible, there are two types of ministers in the New Testament. Here they are. It's in the Bible. They are pastors and they are policemen. So in the Bible, there are two ministers in the New Testament. Pastors and policemen. And they are a minister of God for your good. Now if you don't Obey them, the Bible says you better be afraid. Uh, here we go. So when you do not have obedience to God in the family, and obedience to God in the church, and obedience to God in the government, that sin will work itself out through witchcraft and idolatry and affect every part of society. Again, my favorite question, can you prove that? Everything I say, I should be able to prove the Word of God. Of course! 1 Samuel 15, 23, throw it up, part of verse come up. Woe for rebellion is the sin of divination. King James says the sin of witchcraft. Now this is big stuff I'm going to say right here. Rebellion. Have you ever heard the phrase of the high-handed sin? Everybody ever heard the phrase? That's it right there. That's it. The sin of the high hand. It is this sin. I'm not going to listen to you. Will you begin this out, brother? I was born in 1961. Uh, back in my day, if uh, someone got in the face of a policeman, it was not me. Because in my day, if got in the face of a policeman, you find your teeth on the ground. Was that kind of take a stick and he said, Well, get my face. <laughs> there you go. Get your teeth up. Then Bob and Dad would say, I better be different. Should have done that. Then they got other bottles with that. Right? Now, what do you see? Somebody gets mad, and it amazes It shocks me. I'm more than 60. You'll see. Maybe Wednesday, I hope you don't see Wednesday. People in the face of policemen spitting on them, yelling at them, cursing them. They're in the face, according to Romans 13, they're in the face of authority. And you know what they're doing? The sin of the high. I am not going to listen to you. I'm proving that. God, take 
Great Spirit of Bad King. Don't shoot me. So that's the center. The center of the high hand is basically this. I'm going to give what I want to do. I'll show you what it is. You got it? The center of the high hand. Keep that in mind. I'm going to do what I want to do. Mom, I'm I'll give this apples to the prodigal son. The prodigal son did the center of the high hand. I will not listen to your rules. Mom and dad, I'm tired of your rules. Dad, I'm tired of them on the floor. Give me my stuff, Dad. By the rules of the Old Testament, Dad can kill that guy. So I. Basically, again, it is me putting myself above authority, above God. That's for New Testament. Old Testament, that's for New Testament. Jesus tells Peter these words. If you want to serve me, that's in 16.4. If you want to serve me, the first thing you've got to do is squat. Remember? Did I sell? First thing, you want to serve me? Did I sell? Or in other words, you see that fist in the air? Put it down. I'm not going to be with someone who thinks they're the boss but I'm God. So you put your pride and your arrogance down. Give me seven minutes and I'm done. I read a book by by Edmund Burke. He wrote a book about the French Revolution. I wouldn't read it. It's 1,100 pages. It's like, you know. You pretty much predicted the, the reign of terror that was coming upon France. And you predicted what happens in society when the society falls. I just reduced it to this. Listen to this. Burke says they reject God. They reject church. And they reject, I love this phrase, their conscience. They have made man being, I'm my own God. It happened in the French Revolution. It happened in Russia in 1917. It happened with Hitler in Germany. It has happened today in America. What you see in America is the sin of the high. And I'm not a prophet. The last name was Moses, but I'm not a prophet. <laughs> but when these authorities are torn down, the dam is broken. And all hell breaks loose because there's no restraint, because the church is not being salt and light, and there's no restraint. And if things does not change in America, America will no longer be a nation 10 years from today. We're gone. And I'll say it again. You saw this. The church. So you can sit there, not that you are, you can sit there with your pious, I'm holy, we're going to shut back to you, but your world's going to hell. And so you can sit there thinking we're good. We're not good. Have the celebration of worship. Have the smoke shows. Have this. Have that. Have it all. But you're not changing the life. Even the babies are crying. Deuteronomy 17 12. Look at this verse. Thank God the God does. Take two more weeks off. Look at this verse, man. Deuteronomy 17, 12. The man who acts presumptuously by not listening to the priest. Oh, priest. Now that's authority, right? That's the church. Or stands there to serve the Lord of God. Nor to the judge. No, oh, that's authority. That's the government. There's two of authority right there. That man shall die. You will purge evil from his world.
When I used to get in trouble growing up, my mom would say, I'm going Old Testament on you. <laughs> well, she said she's going Old Testament on me, I knew it would be a bad week. <laughs> Turn off! I'm going Old Testament on you. Oh, dear Lord. I remember one day my mom was the manager of a very big restaurant here in the college. I was about nine years old, I had an egg in my hand. My mom had on a white uniform. And I don't know what kind of my mind. I knew I'm a sinner. <laughs> my, I was here, my mom said that back wall, walking that way in front of me, and I thought, I'll never hear this thing. Mm -hmm. There was no way I could hear my mom say that. But I thought, that's sick. Through that egg. And I was seeing pretty quick. It was a good throw. <laughs> <laughs> that thing's coming back with eight bags, and I thought, it's going to hit my mom. <laughs> and two seconds before hitting my mom, I said, Mom! <laughs> and then she turned, tap <laughs> on the back. Oh, God. And my mom turned, I saw fire in her eyes. <laughs> She said, when I get home, I'm going to Old Testament on you. <laughs> she got home that night, and it will love that out. When I read this verse, I think of my mom. What is the sin of presumption? That's a good question. The word there, presumption, means to boil to rise up. It has the idea of saying, I will not. So imagine somebody boiling with anger. Imagine somebody rising up and they're saying, I will not do this. I will not do this. And I'm telling you something, man. Every time I, I see on TV, I see people quote unquote protesting, I'm thinking, that's presumption. That's presumption. That's presumption. That's presumption. That's presumption. And the Lord gets authority. I will not. I will not. And I often wonder, I wonder what God is thinking. Because God says right here. You see, God told the children of, of Israel, God's children of people. God said, if you have a son in your house and he has this kind of sin and dad and mom is trying to do everything to get that boy under control and the priest is trying to do everything to get that boy under control and if he doesn't want to listen, this is terrible. You will hear this, so you won't like this old video. The word of God says, kill him. Mm -hmm. I snap. God said, I'm not going to have that evil with my people because that evil will filtrate and will hit you and hit you. It just takes one bad person in the company to be so bad. It takes one bad person. It takes one bad kid in the classroom to upset the whole classroom. Right? I can tell you all about that. That's okay. Do you have New Testament to back that up? Better believe it. Now, of course, thank God we don't do that today. Right? So God just says, turn them over to God. God doesn't care. New Testament verse, we have to do the Hold it. Hold it. And people listen to We had a ministry called, I call it stealth ministry. Nobody knew about it. It was me and Scott Simmons and about five more men in the church. And I made the announcement one Sunday morning. I said, listen, ladies and gentlemen, we're trying to help you in your family. And if you have a rebellious son in your family, if you're a single mom, register. Call me. We'll go take care of it. And lo and behold, we got cops. <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes, You're a dick, buddy. And I said, You have a rebellious son that's a chin and will not listen. Give Charlie a boy to talk. Charlie will talk to him. So I got a call with that. I said, Sims, we got to go over a stuff call. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm driving my car. 
See, this is right here. And that bull's right here. I said, boy, why are you to your mom? He said, so I'm smart. That's what he said. So he said, I'm going about 80 miles an hour down. Uh, old, no, 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 no. Sixty road. Sixty road. No, it's just sixty road. Eighty miles an hour. I put the brake on. I was tired myself. I literally turned out the car in the middle of the road. I was like, man, I can't do this. I got to stand down back. <laughs> no, pick my school road. No, pick my school road. I hit that brake, turned that thing on the dial, turned it around. I jumped out of the car. Jumped in the back seat and I said, Let me tell you something, boy. And I said, I will take your butt out today. And I said, If you don't listen to your mom, you will know. <laughs> but basically, the, whole, the guy had it. Now, I'm sick to say this Dolby, it wasn't your boy. <laughs> <laughs> but he was in your family. <laughs> How's he going today? Which one? <laughs> I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yeah. Now, here's what I'm trying to say to this. Hebrews 12. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up to cause trouble. Well, here we go. It may be be defiled, but there be no remorse or godless person. Godless is that word presumption like he saw. Ah, uh, I really am good. I'm sorry. I just want to say the first is this. I've also heard that word immoral. What is that? My good partner James Smith said it this way. That deals with sexual sin. Sexual sin. So you get lust. Hormones are fine. I mean, when you're teenagers, they go out to they go out your ears. <laughs> and so there's, there's you and her sitting down. They know what's going on with them. <laughs> All of a sudden, the hormones start to fly. And what God says, be careful. Be careful. You know, the only sin God says to run from is the sexual sin. All other sins, He says, stand and rebuke it. Sexual sin, Paul says, flee. Feel that sin coming? We got to go. <laughs> Get out. Anyway, here's how James Smith described that. He said, uh, I remember I had a guy in our church who won a, a round the trip, a, a trip around the world, all expenses paid, no meals, had to be paid, no room, no travel, all paid 30 days around the world. He sat in Charlotte Airport in the sixties. And he's so hungry. And he smells the cheeseburger. And the guy says, James said, the guy said, I think I got time to get a cheeseburger before my flight gets here. He orders a cheeseburger. And as the cheeseburger is coming down the line to eat, he hears, Flight 1070 to New York, but aborted right now. And he's sitting there. And ate his cheeseburger, and he missed the flight around the world for 30 days for a cheeseburger. Jenny Smith said, Young boys, you'll be in a position with sexual temptation one day, and you'll be tempted sexually, and you'll fall. And you'll miss all the benefits of the life you have in the future for a second of gratification. That's that step. We start with Let's all stay.